here without my glasses on. Welcome. Good to see your faces. Good morning. Will you turn in your hymn books, <clears throat> as you can see from your bulletins, to hymn number one, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. <clears throat> Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold the force before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt all clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark and doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy words with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stores and angels sing around thee, gather of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, guarding birds and flowering fountain, call us to rejoice in Thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever bless. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depths of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the happy chorus when the morning stars began. Gather love, faith, for us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music, lead us sunward in the triumph song of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here together this morning, to worship together, and to have fellowship with one another. And Lord, just to be able to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. 
So we ask your blessing on us as we try to lift up your name and to glorify you and the Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I will commence with the announcements. Are they on the board there, Brian? As you can see, our worship leader is Rachel Hamilton. We're pleased to have her. I didn't think I announced her right. I said Holman. Where did that name come from? At any rate, uh, we have a fellowship time after the service. Uh, we, we, it's not an elaborate period of time, but we do have tea, coffee, and Timbits. So if you like Timbits, you can have them. But if you like tea and coffee, you don't have to have the Timbits. But we do like to have you with us. We do, being able to take a few moments of each other's time just to see what you're doing so we can better look and what you're doing and praying for you and so on and so forth. So it's a valuable, it's a valuable time and we'd appreciate you being with us. Uh, there's a men's weekly fellowship breakfast at Smitty's. It's at 8.30 on Tuesday morning, or 8 o'clock, I'm sorry. And we have a Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday night here at the church at 6.30. And we, if you've already met at the for a prayer at 9.40 in the morning. We come in and we have, and there must have been eight there in the prayer room this morning. So it was really appreciated. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're going to go beyond, I guess, uh, the offering response. Uh, we are still taking up an offering. I don't have the figures. Do you have the figures right off your head, uh, Florence? You don't? Okay. Uh, maybe next week, if you could prepare the figures uh, for us, just to let us know how we're doing. I know there was $1,290 that was given the last time the announcement was made. That was about a month ago. So appreciate the, the help, and I'm sure that the Ukrainians appreciate it too. If you want to give by way of offering, uh, there's a plate at the back of the church, which you can throw an envelope or any uh, offering you want to put into it. But there's the e-transfer way of giving, and you're also through CBC Giving and through www.mychurchfamily.ca and so on and so forth and all those electronic. So I know nothing about it, but you do. So if you want to use that system, that's great. All right, we'll turn with me once again to number 275, How Firm a Foundation. I know these hymns quite well when I have glasses and I can see them. As you know, I was stumbling a little bit on the last one. So if I kind of pause, that doesn't mean you do. You just keep on singing, okay? Number 275, and let's stand again, give our legs a chance to stretch, and uh, we'll sing this, this, this hymn. <clears throat> How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, aid it laid by your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled, fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will give thee the I'll strengthen thee, thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The fame shall not hurt thee, thy only design. Thy dross to unto, and thy gold to refine. Thy son, and I yeah. 
Number 42. You're doing a good job. You kept right up when I couldn't. 42. Matthew 6.33, if you want to know where it comes from. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Allelu, Alleluia. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to make another announcement right now before we have a prayer. I'm saying this on behalf of you, Ken. You weren't uh, with us after you had to leave, so we'll understand that. But on behalf of the pulpit committee, as you know, we're looking for a pastor. And we have zeroed our find down to two candidates. They are, and they're both very good. And it's very difficult for us as a committee to be totally congruent on one or the other. And uh, so we have looked at it this way. We, the two of them are Jeff Rockwell from Moncton. He was here last November. He hasn't spoken to you people since then. Uh, but we plan on bringing him back so that you can hear him once again. And, uh, <clears throat> but we've been very impressed with him. And we also have our own Bill Knowles right over there. Put your hand up, Bill. <laughs> a little higher. <laughs> Not like that. <clears throat> uh, Bill is from St. Catharines, and uh, he has ministered to us a number of times in the last number of months, and so we have a good idea of what he is doing with us. So we hope to have Mr. Rockwell back sometime in the month of August. It hasn't been nailed down as to when uh, he can come. But after he does, we're going to wait a week, and then we're going to ask you people to come in, and we're going to vote on the candidate. You will get the vote on the candidate of your choice. It's not necessarily how it's always done. Usually in the old days, you just brought a man in, and then afterwards you made a vote. And if he was 100% or 80% or whatever, if it was high enough, you just voted him as the pastor. Well, we've taken a considerable amount of time to refine who we think should be with us as a pastor. And I hope you appreciate that. So that's how we're going to do it. So be listening uh, for when Mr. Rockwell is here, because the following week, that's when we'll be doing the, the vote. Do we have it all right? Is that the way we intended it? Okay. As long as I have everybody's the nodding of the committees, that's good. All right, I want you to join me now in a word of prayer. But before I do, I've noticed that there's quite a few people here for the first time. How many here for the first time? They're visiting us. Nice to have you with us. We appreciate you coming. And we hope you feel right at home. We've got a young man that's going to be speaking here for the first time as well. And so we're all looking for a blessing, and I'm sure we're going to get it. Well, join me now in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he means to us. We thank you for the hope that he inspires in us and the peace that he gives us because it passes all understanding. And we thank you, Father, for the plan of salvation and your overall plan. For is the day, Lord, when you're going to come back and you're going to change this world 
And Lord, we just thank you that we can be part of that big program. So we just want to bless you because we know from your word where you came from and what you did and what you're going to do. And we can follow in those steps and we can see what our future is. So we thank you, Lord, for those, that hope that inspires us. And Lord, as, it, as you inspire us, we know that you are a God that wants to always bless us. We sang to that effect this morning that you desire to bless us. And so, Lord, we ask for your blessing. We ask you, Lord, not that we're worthy, but, Father, because we believe and we reach out by faith to a God of compassion and a God of love. And we'd ask you, Lord, to bless our congregation. We pray, Father, that you would inspire the people even now who are watching us online and you'd put a blessing on their hearts because for one reason or another, not able to be with us. And so we commit them to you. And for all of those, Lord, who are in nursing homes or, Lord, are just uh, invalided and just can't get here, we pray your special blessing on them as we commit them to you. But for the ones that we've been praying for, they're here this morning, and we thank you for that. And, and we just praise you, Lord, because we know that you are faithful and you do look after our needs. So, Father, if there's needs this morning that would be financially based, we pray your blessing. Your word says, ask, as we sang this morning, and you shall receive. And we pray, Father, that you would give us the compassion to reach out to others. And I think this morning of those people down in the Kentucky area, just like us, just common folk, but a wall of water came through that valley, through that, through that area, and just wiped them out. Christians and non-Christians alike, Lord. And already 28 people have been accounted as having perished, and many more are expected. So we ask you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy to be on those people this morning, and we commit them to you. And also, Lord, there was floods in Las Vegas. And I'm sure that there's, while there may not be a lot of Christians in that area, there certainly are Christians. And we pray that you'll help them in their needs. We ask you, Lord, for this Ukrainian war that's going on, this unmerciful attacking from Russia upon that land. And we commit that, that uh, situation to you because the world is in great need of their, of their wheat and their food supply. And we would ask you, Lord Jesus, that in your mercy you would allow some of that food supply to get to very needy nations. And so we commit that situation to you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing. And Lord, we just ask your continued blessing even in the service, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to read the scripture this morning. I think I'm going to pass, because I can hardly see the words. So I'm going to let you do it, okay, Brandon, when you come up? That'll be better. Well, let me ask you a question. How many people believe in providence? A couple of hands went up. <laughs> I would hope all of them would have gone up like that. Well, I want to tell you a providential story. And it leads into our service this morning. I used to like to golf. And I golfed quite a bit at one time. And I haven't been golfing much lately. One, it's expensive. And two, I'm not as good a shape as it used to be. <laughs> At any rate, but this day, back in early June, I said, I'm going to go out and go golfing this afternoon. Just kind of right out of the blue. So I got my clubs and away I went over to this Glen Afton golf course. It was only about seven minutes away from me. And uh, I had a little prayer. I said, Lord, maybe there'd be somebody I'd have a chance to talk to about the Lord today. I used to find that would happen if I went. I hate golfing by myself. I just hate it. I don't even know why I went. But I felt the need to go, so I went. And I had this little prayer, Lord, uh, if I get an opportunity to speak to somebody, I sure appreciate it. That was fine, and I golfed along by myself following. It's nothing worse. If there's four people ahead of you, you know they're not going as fast as you, so you have to hit a ball and wait, hit a ball and wait. And that really frustrates me. So I'm waiting, sitting on this little golf bench that they have. And all of a sudden, about the fifth or sixth hole it was, 
the speaker this morning, young Brandon, he and his wife and another young fella, they come up to me and I said, you want to join in with me? And they said, sure. I said, I'm just waiting for these guys to get ahead of me. They understood that. That was fine. This young fellow that, by the way, is going to be your speaker is a mighty good golfer. I tell you that. He had two birdies in about three holes. If you know anything about golf, he can hit a ball. And uh, so at any rate, we didn't talk much about anything. Told each other our names. That was about all. But the ninth hole came. And young Brandon said to me, he said, Braden. Braden said to me, he said, are you retired? I said, yep. <laughs> He's not doing very good. Maybe that's why he asked me. I don't know. So uh, he, uh, with that, I said to him, what do you young fellas do? Oh, we're just students. Students. Yeah. What kind of students? And he said, we're Bible students. Bible students? Where? New Brunswick Bible Institute. Now, you understand, I graduated from New Brunswick Bible Institute. And I know all of the, you know, the, used to know all the professors and everything else, and still know most of them. And so right away, it's like dropping you into a family of your friends. <laughs> well, you have to know, understand that we, as, as the church, who at least have been thinking in long range about the church and so on and so forth, have been saying for several years, we need a youth pastor. Not very serious, but we keep saying that. We need a youth pastor. And all of a sudden, here's this young man with his wife and near family, Kelsey, <laughs> and they're on the golf cart and they're playing with me and whatever. And so we just were conversating and now the whole time on the ninth hole because that's the only time we had to play the ninth hole. But how providential was that? Here's this young man with a young, not a family, the, the child's not born yet. And they're going to have a need for accommodations when they get from school. Now, they're going back to Bible school this year to do their third year. And then after their third year, their plan is to do the fourth year. Now, the fourth year is what they call a, the, path, the prospective candidate from the fourth year. They go into churches and they work with some pastor for a year to finish their fourth year program. And I'm thinking, lights are going on, things are happening, and I'm thinking, he could be the one for us. Well, it's all providential at this point in time. But it is my pleasure to be able to say to you that we have him this morning. Uh, and what made it even more providential, the next Sunday morning, he's here at our church. <laughs> he wants to see what we're about. And I thought, he's really interested in us. And we're interested in him. And so, Braden lives in Charlottetown and uh, goes to the Gospel Hall. Is it the Gospel Hall? The Charlottetown, Bible. Char Charlottetown Bible Chapel. Okay, that's on Lincoln Road? Okay. Yeah, okay. At any rate, it's a, it's a church that's very alive. I've always been impressed with that work. And now, I'm, and I've been impressed by, I used to work with Pat and the Elephant, and I used to have to pick this guy up all the time and take him over to the church and wait for him. How many young people were in that work? And that's, that's good testimony for a church to have a lot of young people, I'll tell you that. Well, it's my pleasure to be able to invite him now to come and offer us what the Lord has laid on his heart, and I want you to take a good look at this man, because he might be somebody that we want in the future. God bless you, brother, as you come up to minister to us. Do you want to close the last? Do you want to sing the last one? Save me coming up. Sure. Right after. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. And I'm just blessed by that introduction and specifically that he might have overplayed my ability to play golf a bit, <laughs> but still very thankful and very, very thankful for 
the reality that I'm here and I'm, and I'm on this pulpit because when, when Chuck speaks about the providence of God that was involved in, in what happened, on the other side it was just, it was like watching two sides of a story and, and coming here and getting to hear Chuck speak about the way that he's seen it happen was just like, was so crazy to me because after I remember leaving and being, being so overwhelmed by how, how crazy of a coincidence it was to meet somebody um, who had already been through MBBI and MBBI is a small school and we have about 45 students right now and there's not a, a um, great amount of people who you meet that, that they graduated from that school and so that was coincidence enough and, and through conversation the amount of coincidences that continue to come up and just for me to be able to be in front of you this morning and be able to minister to you is just, it's overwhelming and I'm, I'm extremely grateful. And I'm just gonna tell you guys a bit about myself and, and how I landed here and, and what I'm doing right now, my family. And so you guys can understand um, who I am and that, that hopefully will tie well into what I'm gonna be speaking about this morning. And so like Chuck had mentioned, my name is Braden, Braden Donnelly. And I grew up in, um, well, Prince Edward Island. We lived for a year away. My family is here with me this morning. They came and visited. My, um, my wife, Kelsey, there you can see with the baby bump there. That is my wife. And beside her is my, my father, my mother, and my sister. And um, so you can introduce yourself to them um, after the service. My, my grandparents are here as well to share in this time. And yeah, yes, it's great. And so um, I was, grew up in a Christian home and was loved by Christian parents. And, and so I don't have a, an amazing testimony to, um, to overcoming drug addiction or, or all of these things, these great testimonies that you hear. But um, I heard somebody say the other day that um, it is really one of the most glorious things to have a very, very boring testimony because it means you were brought up in, in the, the way that God designed the primary ministry is that the family would love and introduce Christ to their children and they would introduce Christ to theirs. And so uh, I, for a long time, was, was not enthralled with the way that um, I came to Christ. But, but at this point, I look back and I'm just so thankful, especially with a, a kid on the way and to think that this is what God wants, us to minister to our children and our children to minister to their children and, and throughout the, the nations that, that God's name would be spread through. And so... Um, I don't have an extremely uh, amazing testimony in that way, but um, right now what I'm doing is I'm studying at New Brunswick Bible Institute, which was mentioned, and I spent a couple years doing construction and um, before that. So, so after I finished high school, I, I learned a lot about um, living and, and working hard and doing some, um, some difficult construction jobs for difficult hours. And um, I'm not sure if the difficulty of the job and the um, physical toil had anything to do with it, but after two years of that, I do believe that God had called me to go to Bible school and study. And so um, when I went to Bible school, uh, I had already had a large interest in learning and, and, and understanding the scriptures more and more. But when I got to Bible school, it was just like, it just sank, I, my heart sank at the thought that every day for this year, my whole job is not going to be pouring concrete or moving heavy things around and trying to um, trying to build things and be yelled at by old men who are who are angry that their farm is not looking the way that it should. And I, my now job is to understand what God has said to His people through His Word, and that just it sank in, and I realized how much I love the thought of that. And so, for the first year of Bible school, I I studied. And I, I took in and knew more and more about God, what, had, what he had said and what his whole word, word says from the start to the finish and what God's plan was for humanity. And so from there on, I continued to grow a large desire for preaching and, and understanding the word and then ministering it to other people. And so from that, um, my now wife and I, um, Kelsey and I were praying, they were just dating at the time, praying and praying about the thought of going into ministry and the thought of being used in a way that God um, could, be, could be pleased and to be a part of a congregation um, that could use some of the things that I believe God has given me to use. And so it's a large answer to prayer to just be in front of you now. And so um, 
as Chuck was highlighting, the, the fourth year at MBBI, so what you do is, uh, it would be a, like an internship. You, you study while you're at a church, so you get that practical growth of, of being involved in. And so um, go, I'm going into my third year now. I'm going back to study in September, and i um, excited for that year to just get more engulfed in the Word of God and understand it more, and then, um, and then maybe hopefully be here with you guys in, in the year after that. And so, um, so that is a brief summary of who I am in, in small detail. You need to probably talk to somebody for a little while to get to know exactly who they are, but that is going to have a, a bit of a correlation to what I'm going to be speaking about this morning. And if you can see my, my title, say, Characterizing the Christ of the Bible, or just Characterizing Christ, the way that you know somebody is by speaking to them and understanding the way that they work. So anybody who is married here, I've only been married a short time, but I would be pretty convinced that the person who knows me best is the person who has to go to sleep and wake up with me every morning and, and see my, my ups and my downs, and that would be my wife. And she would be able to demonstrate to you guys who I am because she knows me well. And so in the same way, the way that you can understand who Christ is, somebody who we all claim to have a relationship with, you have to know him well. And so the issue in a lot of modern Christianity, in different portions specifically of Christianity, is that they are picking a Jesus to fit what they want. They're molding it to fit what they, what they need. And I heard a funny illustration. I'm not sure if you guys have been to a mall in the last 15 years, but if anybody's been to a mall off island, you might have seen something called a Build-A-Bear. You go in there and you, 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 you're gonna make a teddy bear for yourself and they, you blow it up and then you dress it and you make it whatever you want and then you leave with your Build-A-Bear. And um, I think that an illustration would be fitting that some people have taken the Christ of the Bible and built a Christ to their political or, or just the way that they want Christ to be. And so that is not the correct way that you get to know somebody or, or that you know somebody well, but the correct way to do that is to understand who they are. And like I said, my wife would know me best because she lives with me. And so I'm going to be going through the passage of Hebrews 1, where it is pretty much a, a microscopic breakdown of who Christ is so that we may know him and so that we may understand who he is and have that relationship of knowing him farther than just, just what, what we hear about him on a regular or the basic thing. So I'm going to read Hebrews 1, and um, I think you can follow along with me there. And then we're just going to go um, down through some of these verses that demonstrate who this Christ of the Bible is to us and, and really who he is. And so I'm just going to start, and I'm going to read through it. And so we can hear God's word, so that it's not my word speaking, but that God's word would be proclaimed and that hearts would be moved by that. So Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also created the whole world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all of God's angels worship him. <clears throat> and of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God 
Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So that is Hebrews 1. And I'm just going to go down through some of this so that we can take this very dense chapter. And I'm going to spend a lot of time in, just in, in the first three verses and then breaking down a bit of, of the overview of what the chapter means. But um, So what we can learn, it says in the first verse, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, and it's important to know that the, the audience of the writer is a, is a Hebrew or a Jewish audience, that he's saying to our forefathers, the people who came before us, God spoke to them in, a, in many different ways and at many different times. So the prophets, if you read through the Old Testament, you will see um, people receiving messages from God by way of things like visions. They are conscious and they see something that God wants them to see, and then they tell the people what God wants them to know. Or things like dreams. They're sleeping and God comes to them in a dream and tells them, this is what I want you to go and tell your people. And sometimes, in different ways, God would show up in a person, and you see that is what is called a Christophany of Christ coming and, and showing himself to somebody. You see that in the book of Joshua. And so he comes and tells Joshua something, and then Joshua tells it to the people. And so it's saying, at many times, God spoke to our forefathers, the Jewish prophets, through many different ways like this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things. And so what, what's being said there is that in all this time it was spoken by the prophets, but in these last days, these days that have just come by, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he has appointed the word. And so I think that there is something inside of this verse that, that really in, encouraged me when I read it, that, that he has spoken to us. And speaking, what speaking is, is taking a thought an intellectual understanding and presenting it in the form of words. Like, I'm speaking English today, and everybody seems to be able to understand that I'm speaking English and seems to be understanding it. And that is me taking my thoughts and then using words to demonstrate it. And so in John, the first chapter of John, you see that Christ is called the Word of God. And so... If you haven't understood what that meant before, what it means is that, and you can read it later in this, it says in the um, third verse in Hebrews 1, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And so what he is saying is God's thoughts, the way that I can think something and then look at you and make that language and you can understand, the way that I have a thought and then say it, you guys understand it by the way I say it because I'm speaking. But then God spoke to us in these last days through his son, Jesus. So he sends Jesus to the earth, and Jesus is all of God's thoughts, all of his intellectual being made into a person and living among us. And so, so that is a, is a large thing that we can understand that Jesus is the exact imprint of what God's nature is. I think that a lot, for a long time I had Jesus as a, a, a man who came to earth and he was like cast out, like almost left to his own to live as a man. And Hebrews 1 is telling us that he was God wrapped up in a human and that we can understand God if we can understand him. And Hebrews goes to explain what, who, who this person is so that we might really understand that person. And so you go into 
the second verse, it says that he is the heir of all things. It says, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, who he has appointed the heir of all things. That the heir in Jewish, obvious, um, the context is to this Jewish audience. And heirs at that time, in the family that we don't really um, relate to this family structure as much, but the firstborn of the family would be the elected heir for the Jewish family. That when that Jewish father would die, the, the person who was the firstborn would receive the blessing of passing on the inheritance and also some of the physical blessing would immediately go to him first. And so what is being said here is as God's son, Jesus is the heir of all things. And it goes to speak about all of creation, the people who live on the world, the world itself, that he made it because it says there, through whom he also created the world, that Jesus created the world and that God created it through him so that it was all his. He is the heir of this. So just like a normal Jewish family, the father would have things and that it would be given to the, to the son, the firstborn, the heir. God the father will give to Jesus the son everything that he has made. We are the inheritance of Jesus. Jesus has a love for his creation and we see that in the fact that this, somebody this big, somebody that created the world would also become a part of it in a human body and be nailed on a cross and die. That when he was on that cross, he was paying the price that he could inherit us back. That we are his adopted uh, people. That we are the heirs of Christ. He is going to receive us. And that we see that in the the end times, that he is going to reign over his people and, and that he is going to finally have us. In our disobedience, we walk away from him now, but in obedience, he will fully have us and we will be his adopted heirs. And so um, the book of Hebrews here is, is dense, but it's each verse, you know, you have to spend so much time to understand what is this saying to me. And so there's a couple of Cool things is also said there that you understand that he upholds in the verse three, it says after he created the whole world and he is the radiance of the glory of God. So that just like Jesus was the, 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 the word of God's thought, he is also, if we have a light bulb in that, in that um, fixture there, that God would be the light bulb and he would be the element, but Christ would be the reason that this room is lit up. So that light coming off of Christ is the reason, well, it's day and there's windows open, but if it was dark and there wasn't windows open, you would see no light in here, but Christ, the light off the light bulb, would be the immediate reflection of God, that he came to this earth and completely represented who God is. And so if we can understand Christ, we can understand who God is. And if we understand who Christ is, well, that relationship that we have with him is going to deepen. The same way that if my wife and I didn't really know each other that well. Like if we just went each day, said hi, but we lived completely different lives, I would not know my wife very well. But we are intentional about speaking to each other about what's happening in our lives. And, and we are going through things together. We work through things that are happening in both of our individual lives. And so we know each other personally. And so the same goes with your relationship with God is if you are not in the word learning more and more and more about who he is, or you don't have an understanding, then your relationship with God might be that distant walking by and just saying, hello, hello. But you aren't sitting down and understanding this is who I am. And you're not understanding this is who he is. And for a long time that my life was, was a lot like that. I said I grew up in a Christian home and I was, I was blessed like that, but for a long time my walk with God was almost just like a cultural thing. My family went to church and I went to church, and so my relationship with God was almost inherited with my family. But um, there came a point where God really called me to himself and that my sin was holding me away and that I came and, and I found God for myself, not because my parents knew God, 
but that because I then found God and I, I got to know him. And so after that, I'm reading his word and I'm understanding he is the radiance of the glory of God, that that's who Jesus is and that's who is my savior this morning. And so if you um, look at what it says in the fourth verse, it says that after, or at the end of the third verse, it says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So this chapter that we're going to go through, a lot of the teaching is very dense in the first four verses. But then when you get to the 4th to the 14th verse, the writer of Hebrews has switched from demonstrating exactly the makeup of who Christ is, and then he transitions to why Christ is better than angels. And so he uses 10 verses and 7 Old Testament scripture references to identify why the Christ is better and stronger than angels. And so... We don't really understand the immediate context of why this is. Like in our, in our culture, there's not, or in our immediate Christian culture, there is not a huge emphasis on angels right now. At different times in church history, there was people groups who overemphasized angels, and, and angels are completely real beings. And they, we know from later in Hebrews that they, they might actually, we, some of us might have entertained angels and not even known it, that they're around and that, we might not even known it, but we might have seen one. One might have helped us. But what was very, very pressing in this day, and this is why the writer of Hebrews writes about it, is that the people were idolatrous about angels at this time. The audience was obsessed with angels. There was this, there was this obsession with worshiping angels even in the immediate audience. And you see in a lot of Jewish history, and all through the Old Testament, that if somebody comes into the presence of an angel, they often get down and start worshiping the angel. And so it kind of just goes to represent how small humanity is, that we are so feeble that even an angel we see and we fall down and worship. And a lot of the angels correct them. You see in the book of Revelation, John, the apostle John, goes to worship an angel and he says, what are you doing? Stand up. I'm, I'm like you. Like like, I'm created too, and I worship God, and you worship God. Don't worship me. But there was worship of angels in Jewish context for, for a long time. And so he is writing to prove to this audience that the Jesus that lived, because they seen him as a human being, that Jesus is far greater than any angel. And so don't worship angels. You worship Jesus. And obviously what would have been a difficult time for them was worshiping what was a human at one point. Like all through the Old Testament, Jew Jews were told, you worship no other God but yourself. And they knew that. But now they have a God showing up in human flesh. And you see Thomas falls down and says, my Lord and my God, and worships Jesus. And so it's a hard transition when you are told you don't worship anything but God, and God is in the sky or, or not a physical sense. But then he comes to earth and he demands worship to the person of Jesus. And so it's very understandable why he would have to write this because he's now going to say, you got to worship Jesus, but you have to understand that Jesus is worth worshiping and he is God. Like, like you, some of you worship angels, but angels are way less than Jesus. So worship Jesus because he is God and he is above all of these angels. But it would be hard, and I try to put myself in the shoes, if one of us right now, Christ hadn't come yet, we were all Jews and we were all meeting in the synagogue and somebody stood up right now and they said, I'm the son of God. I'm God's son, worship me. How difficult it would be for us to say, you look like a human, like, I think you're human. Like, it's going to be hard for me to get down and worship you right now. But they were going through this practical transformation. We read the Bible, I do at least, in 
in this lens of my culture today, and I understand that this is what happened, and I say, it's easy for, to worship Jesus. The Bible says that he was God, and worshiping God is what is commanded, and so I can worship Jesus. But when I think about the context of saying, we do not worship anything but God alone, and then somebody says, I am God, worship me, it would be very difficult. And so that's why, that's why you have three verses demonstrating some of the most dense theology in the New Testament, and then ten verses of him trying to convince people like Jesus is better than angels. It's not just because, it's for the reason that they were having a hard time transitioning to the fact that they would have to worship God as a human. And so it's very understanding. But just to go through some of the verses, there are some very practical verses um, for us to know going through some of them. He says um, in, verse, in verse 5, he says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so the first argument, he says, is Jesus is better than angels because, like, which of the angels would he have ever said, you're my son, like, you are my offspring. I, you are a form of me. And if you are a form of God, you are God. Which of the angels would he have ever said that to? None, because they're not God. And so he uses that and then you continue to read on through, and these are all Old Testament scriptures that he is saying and that are spoken to Jesus and things that you can learn about Jesus from this. Um, you come to verse 8, and it says, but, all, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Did you know this morning that there is a large percentage of Christianity that rejects that Jesus is God, that Jesus was God. And to that group of people, and I really struggled with it, actually, if I'm being honest, for a little bit. When I got to Bible school and we started going through these things, I started really coming to the fact that, do I believe that a human that walked on earth, like any other human, was really God? And then when I read this chapter, I said, that's what God's mind is on the subject. He was God. Because he says, he says this, God of the Son says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. So I think that a very practical rule of obeying the Bible is if God says it, that we believe it, and we believe the same thing as God. Okay, so God says of the Son, your throne, O God. If God calls Jesus God, we should call Jesus God. And so when we understand that, it, it, it opens our mind to what the story of the gospel is. This wasn't another human who, who lived a life and got crucified at the end of it. That the step down, later in Hebrews it says that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels that we see through this passage that Jesus is, it's not even comparable. He uses 10 verses to say, it's not even close. Jesus is way better than angels, and here's all the Old Testament scripture that God used to tell us that. It's not even close. But then it says later in Hebrews that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, that at a time, some God of the universe who created all things actually became lower than a part of his creation and became human became us and that he bore the sin for all of us that my sin your sin all everybody's person who has sinned he bore all of that in his body after living a perfect life and he died becoming a little lower than the angels and then we see it says um in verse um, 11, it says, They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, and like a robe you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. The difference between Jesus is that he is eternal. And us, we are living in the flesh that will die, and our, our bodies will decay and go, but Christ was the only one who lived and though he was made a little bit lower than the angels, though he took on human flesh, 
he was God and his years would have no end. That he died, but he was resurrected and he, he brought himself up from, from the life or God raised him from the dead and his years will have no end. Defeating death makes you better than any human ever because all of us are going to die and, and, and it makes you far better than all angels because you are then sat down at the right hand of God and he says, you sit here and I'm going to make your enemies my footstool. I am God and you are at my right hand, O oh God. It's, it's God saying, you are God. And so understanding this is, has been so pivotal to my faith that the fact that when I read the Gospels, I'm not reading about a man who came down and died. I'm reading about God who said, I love my creation. I love that I created everybody. I knew them before the foundation of the earth. I love them so much and they're down there and they've lost me. All have gone astray. All have sinned and fall short. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. But I love them. And I will become even less than the angels. I will become a human less than the angels. And then I will become the lowest of all humanity. It says that he was marred more than any man. That Jesus was put on the cross. And he was made the lowest of even humanity. And so when I read the Bible now, I don't read this story of a man dying. It's God seeing his love for the creation of the world and redeeming us through that. And we can understand Jesus through that. And so the question I'm going to leave you with this morning and that I leave myself with as well, because this is not something that somebody ever gets to the point of, of getting. This is the, the battle that we will have till, till we finish our walk on earth. The question is, who is the Jesus that you worship? How do you characterize Jesus? Is there something that you say about Jesus in your mind that, that isn't true from the Scripture? And so what you, what you need to do is go to the Scripture. Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 1. It's, it's no coincidence that at the first of a lot of these books is an intense study on why Jesus is God and why you need to worship him as such. It's in the first chapter of Hebrews, Colossians, and John that this is an important thing, that we know who he is, that we can relate to him correctly. And so when you sit here this morning, you ask yourself, do I know Jesus the way that I need to know him? And the answer for all of us is no. Like, like we all need to know him better. And, and that is amazing that we have this day. And I think Sundays are such a fitting time to have church because you're going to start a new week and before us is a, the lot left of a beautiful day that if you decided you could know Jesus more in, of, of who he is as Savior, as Redeemer, and as God over all, that he created the world, that he sustains it, he holds it in his hand, and he owns it all. And eventually, he's going to come back and inherit all of the things that he is right to inherit. And we will live under him, and he will reign over us. And so, I encourage you, and I encourage myself this morning, spend time getting to know him who is your king. You're a Christian this morning. You are a son or a daughter under the King Jesus, and you have all the resources in the world to know him better. And so all you need to do is fight your flesh. Ask God to give you the power to understand what his word says about himself, that you may know him more and that you may walk in obedience. And I need to do this so much. I think about through the weeks, things that happen, and you just you, you can react so problematically like something happens small. But when you look, you take a step back and you get here on a Sunday morning, you realize... I am a servant of the God of the universe and he came down and he loves me and he cares about me individually and personally and I can know him and relate to him. And if you own a Bible, you have the resources to know him better and the spirit of God will show you and reveal this is who Jesus is and there's no, you can't unsee when you see Christ as who he is. And so that is my message to you this morning and to myself, um, first and foremost. And um, 
I suppose that I am going to lead the last song as well. So we'll see how that goes. Um, 202 in your hymn books. Number 202. I'm just going to pray with you guys. That's, I'm not sure if that's how that works, but I am going to pray with you guys. That's good. So let's just go in prayer. You guys can sit if you want, if that's comfortable for you during this too. God, we just come before you and um, we're here on a Sunday morning to understand more about who you are, God. You have designed the church to be something that builds um, upon itself, that, that people would come and build others up. And so this is not a Sunday morning. We don't show up here, and this is the extent of our life with you, God. But I pray that as each leaves, that they would be carried through their week in constant thought of the thought of, do I know the Lord Jesus adequately? And may God just truly reveal the depths of the, of the holiness of Christ that we will never stop, even as that song says, that, that we'll have no less days to sing of God's grace, that we'll never know the depths of the ocean that we swim in of the grace. And um, the same goes with the righteousness of, of Christ, that we'll always be wondering how much more righteous could he be, how much more holy could he be. And so I thank you that you... Um, are gracious to us through your Son, that we have all walked from you, yet you count it worthy, Jesus, that to you would take on flesh and live amongst men, that you might become the sin offering for the people of earth, the Lamb of God. And we look to you as our Lamb, our sacrifice, that you took our place, and we're forever thankful, God. I'm thankful for this church, for the people in it, and that they love you and that they show up here faithfully to know more about you, God. So go with them and, and carry them through this week on the fact that they know 
and they are, they are kin with the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of, of all. And so we just give you thanks in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your time this morning, guys. And you can also pray for me. I'm going to um, a Bible camp this week. I'm going to council there, and so I'll, I'll be able to speak to uh, 13 and 14 year old kids about about God. And some of these people have never even heard about Him, or nonetheless know Him. So if you have any time, pray for that week that I would be intentional with speaking to some of these children. So thanks again. Do, do. Thank you very much. Oh, goodness, it's like you're totally true. <laughs>